Hi there. Um, thank you for passing that over to me. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, my name is Jasmine Sneed. I'm a co-founder of Aurora Tights, and I'm happy to be a moderator for this three-way conversation. So first, I would like to introduce Latanya Foster from Milani Cosmetics and Sahir Murray from Legacy History Pride. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi. Hey, thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. So I let's kind of give, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're all used to the 30 second, one minute pitch. Um, if each you can kind of like describe yourselves and your, and your products to the audience. Um, Latanya, if you want to go first. Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm, I am head of people and culture for Milani Cosmetics, and we are a multicultural, multi-generational makeup brand. We've been around for a number of years, but um, right now, you know, we are focused on growing our brand awareness and making sure people know about the Milani brand. So um, yeah, so that's where we are. Oh, and me, you do want to more about me too, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I'm from Detroit, Michigan originally. I currently live in LA. I am a very, very proud graduate of Howard University many moons ago. <laughs> um, yeah, so just happy to be here. Thank you so much. Stay here, you want to follow up? How's it going, everybody? My name is Tahir Murray. I am a senior marketing major at the illustrious Howard University. Um, I'm the proud CEO of Legacy History Pride. Um, Legacy History Pride is a collegiate lifestyle brand where we design, develop product that embody everything HBCU culture and uh, black excellence. So we make everything from cardi or excuse me, sweaters, um, hoodies, uh, sweatsuits, you name it, uh, a little bit of everything. I'm um, sure trying to provide substance and, and quality apparel for the HBCU community. And a portion of our proceeds do go back to the black colleges that we are partnered with and we're licensed with. Um, and we're also a proud partner with the Atlanta HBCU Alumni Alliance. Um, and we just work with them and, and do different events throughout the year uh, to provide awareness and raise funds um, for uh, schools and, and provide opportunities and scholarships for current students and prospective students. Wow, that's awesome. You both are so accomplished doing great things. <laughs> so just as um, opening about setting up shop, um, we all know starting an e-commerce business is hard work with a lot of different steps and decisions that seems like has to all come together at the right time. So after you selected your product, written your business plan, marketing plans, and you set up your online business, this is the part we're talking about now, which will cover strategies for acquiring customers, point of sale technology, and building a successful online business. So leading from that, Latanya, I want to kind of get started with asking a few questions for you. Um, what has it been like working for Milani Cosmetics so far? Um, it's been wonderful. I mean, we're a small team, but um, you know, very passionate group, and which I love because, you know when you're talking about the external customer and which we all tend to focus on, especially when building our brand, it's like, how do we get to the customer, right? Well, my job is really to focus on the internal customer because without them, you have no external customer. So, you know, that is just means like, who is going to be a part of that company in order to drive your business? And that is extremely important from a financial standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, from everything else. Like you need people that are gonna help you run your business that um, get your brand, right? So it's been a wonderful experience. Um, I think that they have really nailed the head on that one, um, just in terms of knowing, you know, who's going to be driving um, the, the external customer. So it's been great. <laughs> awesome, thank you for expanding on that. So here I'll ask a question for you next. Um, can you really just dig on deeper on what made you start Legacy History and Pride? Right. Um, so I can't share my story without first starting off my grandfather's story. Uh, he came here as an immigrant from Trinidad and Tobago, 1966, with the, just the searching for his American dream. And his American dream was providing opportunity for himself, his family, for his community, the people in his neighborhood. Um, long story short, him and my father uh, went into business and they acquired the first black owned Nike account in the United States. So um, I grew up in the Vaughn sneaker store, my grandfather, Ordner Vaughn Murray, and had the Vaughn sneaker store in Queens, New York. And I just grew up just around fashion and just around their energy. And I, I come from a very proud, strong uh, West Indian family. So um, everything was just centered around just like, you know, just energy and just vibrant and community building. Um, so I just, I, I just grew up just being, being, just soaking all of that information and that knowledge as a sponge. Um, and my, my dad, he had different clothing lines as well. He was also in the collegiate, um, collegiate apparel business. And when I got to Howard, that's when I knew that I just wanted to do something special for HBCUs. You know, um, our stories are constantly swept underneath the rug. And, and I just wanted to 
provide, you know, you know, establish a platform to to share the stories in, in the HBC community, and as well as providing, you know, high quality product um, for the people. And um, yeah, like I, like I said, like it's all been in my DNA of just being a business person. I've learned it from my family, learned it from my mother, my, my dad, my, my grandfather. So just continuing the family's legacy in the apparel industry. Yeah, that's cool. Very yeah. cool. Thank you for sharing that. And mm-hmm. you know, entrepreneurship is in your veins. Um, and the, I can see that passion as you were talking about it. So this question is actually a little bit more related to both of you. Talk about customer acquisition. Um, we know that's a huge part of any business. And Latanya, if you were able to kind of talk about it from your perspective, your position for VP People and Culture, um, how do you acquire customers per se? So um, I, I'll, just, I'll answer this in kind of two parts. One, you know, from a very traditional sense of inquiring, I mean, it's just marketing, right? But also understanding what your brand is, because without understanding what you're selling, you have no uh, you have no uh, base to sell to. Um, so, you know, my my role in that and why I kind of push a lot from the like from the people and culture standpoint is because again it's really just important to understand like who that uh, who you're marketing to um, because you can have all the tools in the world but if you don't understand what you're supposed to be selling you know it's or if you don't have people that can help you sell it like it's going to be very difficult so um, whether you're a team of you know two or seven 15 a hundred a thousand you know it's just really super important to understand what that is and what you're you're selling the other part you know I think from that traditional sense so the other part of that is you know from the people and culture standpoint I really like to focus on you know the placing a lot of emphasis on the cultural aspect of it not to say that you know having strengths in what you are doing is not a selling point like meaning if i'm good at hr you know i can be good at hr from a technical standpoint but does that mean that i can connect with what the company is what the brand is what the people are that's a completely different thing it goes for finance to marketing and everything else so it's really important to you know as for any emerging brand to really put an emphasis on that piece of it like you need to you need to build that HR people culture perspective as you are building your brand because it works both ways. So your internal and external customers really need to connect um, on that level. And I feel like as you scale, that becomes even more important, but it's foundational. You know, it's not something you want to think about in the aftermath. Like you've already, you know, you're pulling in millions of dollars, but your whole team is a mess. You know, that, that tends to ruin businesses faster than anything else. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for touching on that. That was very, very good to hear. Good stuff in that. Um, to hear very similarly. So how do you acquire customers and why is that important for your brand? Right. For me, it's it's a little bit of two things. One, it's it's knowing the history and the importance of HBCU culture. Um, we talk about the leg, the literal legacy history pride of HBCUs. It's so rich. It's so vibrant. It's so historical. Mm-hmm. And I want to, uh, I make product that you know, matches that matches the standard of excellence that's rooted in HBCU culture and, and rooted in who we are as black people. So definitely that's that's like the first step, right? The second step is knowing the community that is here already and, and knowing what they need. And and for me, I like to be very, very transparent with our customers and very transparent with the community. Um, I like to just, you know, uh, do different interviews with different people throughout uh, the HBCU community and, and just have different talks. Um, I write a lot of blogs now, like I just do different things to just better connect and, and have a better understanding for not only who I am, but also just the community that I'm trying to uplift. Um, so so community building and then finding different ways for all of us to connect is very important. And that goes into play with like, you know, everything that we do with the HBCU Alumni Alliance. Mm-hmm. One of our biggest events that we partner with them for the year is the HBCU 5K walk run race. And last year we were able to raise like over $90,000 in scholarships for students. And, and that was like really, really cool to also just see so many different alumni groups and fraternities and sororities come out or it was virtually this year, but just to still virtually participate in this activity um, as bringing awareness to, you know, health and awareness in, in the black community, but also just in the support of, of continuing to uplift, you know, HBCUs and, and being engaged. So it, it's, it's just all about, you know, bridging different connections and bridging gaps within our space and, and making sure, you know, we're providing the best, you know, opportunities and product for our customers. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Having quality for your, your customers is key. Thank you for expanding on it from a few different angles. Mm -hmm. um, very similar to some of the themes that you were talking about. You know, this has been an unprecedented time. You know, this has really leaned on the importance of e-commerce for businesses as a distribution channel. Um, if both of you can kind of elaborate on, you know, how has business been during the pandemic? Tony, if you wanted to start us off. Oh, gosh. Um, insanity. <laughs> um, you know, I, I always think, you know, I, I can't wait, honestly, like in 10 years, this is going to be like a true case study in all areas in mental health, in business, everything is just changed the way that we live, the way we shop, the way we, you know, communicate. All the tools were already there. It's just, you know, I think from a business standpoint, a lot of, we were, you could choose, right? You could lean into your e-commerce part, or you could say, yeah, I'd rather have, you know, my customers coming into the store. I think that, uh, or, you know, choose some other way that you're going to sell, market, etc. I think that this, um, the pandemic has really shifted a lot of businesses into requiring that they, you know, they true up what their e-commerce function is and to make it tight. But it's also, I think, been challenging because there's so many components to making that right that are kind of out of our control sometimes, like the shipping, the docks, the warehouses, all of those moving pieces that, you know, you you are interfacing with, but they're having their own challenges. And so when those things get backed up, so do you. And then you have to now face your customer and say, so yeah, that shipment we said was gonna come next week, it's not, you know? Mm -hmm. And while you would think everyone would understand that we're all in this together and this is, you know, happening to everyone at the same time, people want their products and they want them when they said they were going to get them. And they're, you know, more than anything, we're all kind of holding on to senses of control, right? So it's like, okay, you told me this was coming. I want my, you know, um, I want my product. And so now it's like a whole customer service element that we have to also dig deeper into and lead with grace and empathy and all of those things, because, you know, it's just trying all together. Um, uh, for me personally, you know, my job is very like internally customer facing, meaning, you know, I am responsible for communicating with our employees. So, you know, even before starting with Milani and my uh, previous employer like this has been a challenge for anyone kind of working in those roles just because everyone is stressed and you don't mm -hmm. want to see your employees stressed you don't you know but we have a business to run right so it's kind of like how do we ensure that we're keeping employees engaged and that we are also more also keeping our external customer engaged so it's a balancing act for sure um, I think a lot of us are all, and you know, here I'm sure you can attest to this too. Like, it's kind of a, a trial and error. You know, you're like, okay, I'm gonna try this, see if it works. Oh, okay, did work. Great, let's run yeah. with it. And try something <laughs> else, and then be like, that was a fail. Let me move on to something else. And so, but again, having kind of that grace, you know, of leading with that, it helps because you know we don't really have a choice. Like, we have to figure it out at this point. So. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's the beauty of entrepreneurship, though. It's just like exactly. thirsting in these areas that are just so unknown. And I think like, especially during these times, you become so much more powerful when you look at um, obstacles as a way to move forward yeah. and, and you see them as opportunity. So for me, it's just like, yeah, we had to delay like product coming in and stuff like that. And, and, and as a brand, we already stood on the principle of we're going to be transparent with our customers. So we were able to like communicate that. And of course they were fine with it because it was out of our control. But another thing about just seeing things as opportunity is that there's a lot that happened outside of just COVID-19 during these times. When you look at, you know, social injustice and everything going on. So for me, it was very important for me to find different creative ways to share my story, share the black story and the HBCU story and talk about the importance of of our culture and the importance of HBCUs and really get into these conversations. Because yeah. a lot of people right now, a lot of corporations and businesses are starting to market and, and starting to, you know, um, value the importance of diversity. But, you know, we have to make sure that we're holding people accountable and, and, and also that we're showing people that this isn't a trend. This isn't right. a bad, like we have to keep this momentum going and to really like implement change. Um, so that was like one of the biggest things for me that I just saw as an opportunity. I was like, if I just got to use this as a chance to just, you know, shine a light on the culture and shine a light on what I'm doing, then I'm going to do the best I can and use all the outlets and resources I can to do that. 
Yeah. Absolutely. So well said, both of you. Thank you for touching on so many aspects and the shared experience of it all, the social injustice and how that needs to be reflected in brands. And that just really just streamlined us to the next topic, which is talking about branding. You all have talked about at different points where you're talking about customers want their product at a certain point. That's a reflection of your brand. Um, talking about, you know, we want to embody the, for, for your business about the Black people's experiences within our brand. Um, and so as a lot of the team expand on it for a lot of the young entrepreneurs in the audience about how important a brand is and what does that mean for the larger company? Pierre, let you go first. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, branding is very important for me because I just feel like work is, I don't see what I do as work. I see it as a lifestyle. Um, a lot of the brand is, is, is piece of me because it's my story, my family story and, you know, my HBCU experience in that story itself. So, you know, um, as far as branding, I just like to, I'm big on storytelling. I'll say that a million times because mm -hmm. people connect to a why, people connect to a purpose. Um, and that's something that's very unique about Black entrepreneurs is that we really stride and leave with a, a, a great purpose. If you go to an HBCU, there's so many students who are first generation college students or, you know, the, the first person in their family to be a doctor, a lawyer, whatever you name it. So um, there, there's just so much just richness in that itself. So for me, everything has been very authentic and very organic. Everything that I do for the brand really comes from me and like comes from the heart and everything that my parents have instilled in me and my, my grandfather, you know, uh, putting me in at a young age. So, you know, authenticity is like one of the biggest things that people ask for anyway. But, you know, when, when, it's, really, when it's really you, it, it becomes just so much true. You know, the, the brand's just, you know, it, it's just easier to resonate to and easier to connect with. Um, and that's how people are shopping nowadays anyway. You know, they're looking at how are you making a difference? Like, why should I invest in you? For me, it's like everything about the brand is deeper than product. Um, so I have to share, like, like I really think product is like 10% of it. Everything else is about the storytelling and how, like, and just like who I am and like what my purpose and what I'm trying to do. So. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'll, I agree completely with that. I think that the, sto the story and the narrative is key and critical and really, you know, what what you're selling, it will sell itself when you have the right story. But yes, it really is about the authenticity of it for, you know, for the company Milani, you know, diversity has always been just embedded in our products like we just from the beginning, many, moon, many, many moons ago, that's really where we started was high pigmented color for, you know, all skin tones, right? That has become a trend in the industry, the cosmetic industry and in, in, in all across. So, you know, as we feel like a lot of the other companies may be catching up to that, it's great to see, you know, but mm -hmm now it's like a matter of keeping the authenticity in our branding without it making it feel like we're trying to make blackness a trend because that's just not what it is you know um and so you know it's a constant evolvement too so whereas we can't let necessarily rest on things like yes maybe our our company was founded in that but you know people don't care that something happened you know 30 years ago like what's what are we doing right now in this moment and the world is moving so fast that you know it's so important to kind of catch up and be a part of that experience so you know you know what you, how your brand can fit into that but from an authentic place not like okay let me let me jump on this train so that you know i can sell my products if it's not if we worry about more what the customer experience is and that's both in again i'll talk to the internal customer too but both internally and externally we again it feels like the product will sell itself because you're you're not fo so much focused on pushing things out the door as you are is how are we relating as people for within this brand mm -hmm. absolutely that was just so well said you know customers to your point they want authenticity they want a more, that'll be like in, enrich their customer experience and that's what they're wanting in all the products that they're buying so thank you so much for touching on that um, to hear, this might be a little bit more oriented to you, but I was wondering if you could talk about how you create the best products, the product images and descriptions, and, you know, making sure that it's authentic with your brand. Yeah, that took a lot of time for me because, um, as, as far as like the photography and, and creative direction, the marketing, I kind of do a little bit of everything, um, especially just as a small business and I'm, I'm still in college, so I'm still trying to figure it out, but, you know. I work with being at Howard, I have access to so many um, 
you know, models and photographers, videographers, just, just a whole network. So it's easy for me to really share the HBCU story because I'm connected with it. I'm connecting with the students. I'm connecting with just a mixture of everybody. Um, just trying to, you know, shine a light on, on different things going on. Um, because with, with my business, it's, it's all about sharing the story of HBCUs. And as we know, Black culture, that's just an umbrella. There's so many pieces of Black culture that aren't represented all the time. So for me, you know, as far as just the just the branding and, and you know, the, pro, the, the details that go into the product, I'm giving people like what they want. Um, I, I'm, I like to be on social media and be very active and, and show people like what I'm working on, designs I'm working on, like get input, like figure out what people want. And, and that just like, that just goes to shit, just goes to show about the transparency that we have. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it, I'm still like balancing it and, and learning how to, you know, maneuver through it as, as a college student. But for me, like I couldn't do a lot what I do without, you know, Howard University and, and the network that mm -hmm. I've, I've gained here. Um, that has helped me, you know, implement different things in my business, you know, stuff that I've learned in and outside the classroom. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. No, absolutely. And thank you for, for touching on all that. That yeah. was really cool. And um, Latanya, I really want to touch on culture with you from the VP of people and culture, like to the point that Tahir was making about staying with the times. How do you ensure that um, at Milani? Um, so I think that from a brand perspective, the culture piece comes with having the right people. And that is what I'm really passionate about. Um, jobs are jobs, you know, we need money to survive, you know, at the end of the day. But, you know, I think that you can really kind of create special experiences from, you know, um, from company to company. I think that it is uh, crucial to really kind of set the tone inwardly so that you can set the tone externally. And so the culture piece, you know, I, I, I feel like we're such in a special place right now. Um, again, as wacky as 2020 was, a lot came out of that where, you know, people were just tired of like kind of living under, you know, false pretense and it just became tiring. And I think that it has led everyone to feel like they can live a little bit more authentic, authentically. And so that becomes a part of the fabric of us, right? And so to speaking to that culture piece, <clears throat> excuse me, becomes a lot easier um but you know it it does come with its challenges because we have to keep open dialogue you have to communicate we can't you know push our people of color and especially black people in particular um on the forefront of things without you know really learning about their experiences and so that's kind of you know what the work that i'm doing you know at milani but also kind of everywhere is this to help people understand like what your internal uh, culture is and how that shapes the employee experience and how that employee experience molds and shapes your entire brand. Hmm. Absolutely. That was just so, so well put. Um, kind of touching on some of the things you even mentioned a little bit earlier. And I know to hear as an entrepreneur, you definitely feel this too, the idea of these moving pieces and how you have to adjust and pivot. Um, is there any way that you know, like, okay, it's time for time to pivot, or maybe that pivot didn't work. It's time to move on to something else. Like, what are some indicators for you um, to hear if you want to start us off? Um, I don't force anything. And, and I think that's been like essential for me, like working on different designs and layouts or, you know, uh, photo shoots. You know, if, I, if I'm spending so much time in a photo shoot, like I just, it gets to a certain point where I just know like, all right, it's time to like wrap it up and like, you know, whatever we have, we have like definitely not forcing any of the content that we push. Yeah. Uh, so that would be like a major thing for me. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, another kind of key indicator um, is, I mean, it depends, like, you know, I'm a data person. So, you know, sometimes you can look at the numbers and like this ain't working. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and it's time to move on. I think a part of being successful in pivots is, you know, not being scared to do it. You know, sometimes you just have to kind of take a little bit of a leap to, to change what you're doing to see if it works out. That, that risk isn't really, you know, sometimes it doesn't pay off immediately. And so that's what can be the scary part. But I think in any part of a, a, a change or a pivot, you really have to kind of look at, you know, um, not only the risk factors, but like what could happen if we really succeeded and you kind of just running with that. 
Um, so sometimes it feels like you're jumping off a cliff a little bit, uh, but that's okay. And being okay and not knowing what's going to come next, sometimes that really does yield the best results because you're just, you're, you're moving in intuition and not in, you know, like looking at that, a lot of that at points and being like, yeah, this is the best strategic move. Like the yeah. intuition really is super important in entrepreneurial show. Yeah. I think, um, just to add on again, uh, I think one of my favorite things that I've kind of picked up as an entrepreneur is just learning so much about myself. Yeah. Um, I just read Shelly Archambault's book. She's like the first woman CEO of a tech firm. And she talks a lot about just being self-determined, yeah. but she says it all starts off with just understanding who you are and, and, and like having a great understanding of like where you want to go. And that's kind of like with history, like you can't understand where you're going until where you've been. So yeah. for me being self-determined is like, you can't understand, like you can't, you can't really understand where you want to go until you understand who you are and like where you come from and where your roots are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just kind of like back where I was saying about, you know, I just know when I need to take a break or when I move on, when I need to move on to the next thing. A lot of that took so much time and experience um, that it, I've just developed over the years of being yeah. able to really assess and understand who I am when I need to take a mental break. You know, we talk a lot about like mental health. Um, and, I, and I read a lot of books on anxiety and stuff like that. So it's, it's just so important to just really understand like who you are. You know, and uh, let me let me let me circle back on that if you don't mind. So um, I, I love that, and, and here's why. So I you know I am a half entrepreneur at this at this stage of my life. I was a full one for a number of years. I I own a consulting firm, it's Fresh Success, Fresh Success Consulting. I do. Um, HR consulting for small and mid-sized companies. And um, I was doing it and loved it and I still love it. But, you know, if you come to points in your entrepreneurial journey where you're just tired, <laughs> you're like, mm -hmm. I need a break, right? And sometimes, you know, you, do, do you it depends on where you are in your life. That depends on how you take that break. You know, do you completely quit the company? Do you sell it? Do you, you know, change it into something else? And I, I remember the time, this was a few years ago, you know, we, my husband and I, we were starting a family and I was like, um, yeah, I need to be less stressed. And so, you know, that was a, at that time. And I'm like, I'm going to do something different. So I went back into the workforce. Wonderful decision for me at the time. But I feel like once you start that entrepreneurial journey, you kind of dip in and out of it for the rest of your life. Right. And you, you lose that fear of doing it on your own and you just make the decisions that are best for you at that time and what catapult your goals in at that time so as your goals change you know you can also say yeah this is what I want for my life right now um and I feel like that 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 piece that you just said about like the mental health piece and like just knowing who you are at your core and like how you want to move is super mm -hmm. important in that mm -hmm. Wow, you you both just gave us so much there. Like, so funny, <laughs> but all those notes I'll just pass on. But I definitely even feel as an entrepreneur myself. There's times and seasons for everything, and the importance of leaning into intuition. You know, there's of course data driven decisions, but intuition is something completely different and is so valued in entrepreneurship. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, kind of question leaning on that. So, like, I think for as entrepreneurs, I feel like naturally come up with a more expanded view of success. I would say, you know, so a lot of things don't feel like traditionally look, looking like failures or anything like that. Has there, can you talk about um, maybe exiting from positions or moving the different ways of life and how like you've gained these entrepreneurial skills and how it's kind of carried you no matter what stage you've been in? So Latani, if you wanted to start on that. Sure. So I think it's a mindset um, of looking at things as kind of holistically and not like successes or failures, right? Because what is a success and a failure today for you is something completely different six years from now, you know, because you're who you are in six years is so much different. And you're, you're, you're leaning on things that, you know, you can walk away from, like you might be fighting for, and I mean, that goes for anything work, you know, relationships, um, anything like if you are working super, super hard toward and with something in this very moment and it fails right in this moment, you can be like, man, that didn't work out. But one, did it, did, was it a failure or did it, was that supposed to happen so that you can move on to something next and what was supposed to be the ultimate goal? And when you're resting in that and you're like, man, if what would have happened if that, that failure didn't happen, right? Where would I have been? So it, to me, it's more like taking the experience and learning from it and learning with it and growing with it instead of looking at it as a very like linear success or fail. 
Um, because, and, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it's just, you know, about the experience of life, the experience of work, the experience of, you know, fulfillment. Um, and so I don't think that that's just like a one kind of straight line. I think it's very kind of, you know, <laughs> goes like this and it changes as we change and as we grow, um, you know, on our journey. Hmm. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Like it is not linear, you know, that is completely, you know, trusting know. Trust in your journey and there's so much you're learning from it that'll help you at some other point in time. But see here, mm. I want to open up and see what your thoughts were on the topic. Yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of something that you sign up for as an entrepreneur. Like you kind of sign up knowing that you're going to fail, not to be a failure, but you're going to fail along your journey. Um, but I think that like, for me, I love learning and if I win every single time, I'm not going to learn anything. I'm not going to take anything from it. But when I look at my quote failures or challenges, obstacles, you name it, I learned so much and, and value all the things that I've gained from those things that just didn't go the right way. Um, and that's what makes you a stronger entrepreneur, a stronger individual. So I, I take value in that. Um, as far as well, like what is what is success for my business? Like I never looked at that as like an economic from an economic standpoint. I always see success as like as the impact that you make. Um, the the best brands in the world and 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 the brands that I look up to are, are brands that really consistently stride on just making an impact in communities and, and an impact in the world. So that's how I value success. And and you know you're gonna you're gonna trip up and scrape your knee along the way, but that's that's every entrepreneur that's every single entrepreneur absolutely yeah. every single entrepreneur um yeah. so kind of just to wrap things up along those same lines if you can give one piece of advice to you your younger self as you were starting your business or any type of new entrepreneur from like a lesson learned or one piece of valuable advice <laughs> what would that be and that would be our closing question okay. um you want me to take it first you got it you got okay. it okay I would say, um, take it day by day, like start with a plan, but take it day by day and, and be okay with that. You know, we sometimes have, you know, I, and I am extremely guilty of this. I, you know, I set a goal, meet the goal and I'm on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Um, it's something to be said to kind of sit and cherish what you have accomplished because it moves so fast. And so you can't really, set the next goal without really appreciating the one that you just um, hit. And so, you know, a date, like just sit, like rest in your entrepreneurial journey um, because it's, it's a feat and you, you know, if you're doing it, that's amazing. And mm -hmm. if you made money today, great. <laughs> like, and so, you know, I think kind of always just checking in every day on, you know, the purpose in what you're trying to do is super helpful in practicing the gratitude within that. Hmm. Um, my parents wrote in my second grade yearbook, the world is your oyster. And at the time I had no idea what that meant, <laughs> but that message means so much to me now. Um, the world is literally your oyster. Like you can do whatever it is you want. We look at all the, the greats in the world. Like they don't just do one specific thing. If you look at LeBron, Serena Williams, anybody, Oprah, they do so many different things showing you that you could do whatever you want, you know, that life presents you um the only thing stopping you is you and it's so cliche but it's so true as long as you just have um purpose and, and a plan and you're just very passionate about everything uh that you have going on then like that could take you so many different places um i i can't tell you how many times people like see saw me as like the underdog like i'm a 21 year old starting a business in college you know getting hbcu and, and collegiate licenses like it, it's something that's unheard of but I enjoy being the underdog. I enjoy like surprising people. So I'm gonna continue doing like just that. But the world is your oyster is something that, you know, I've, I've that's always like stuck with me even when I didn't even know what it meant. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Taking it day by day and the world is your oyster are two key lessons that, you know, will enrich anybody. So thank you both so much. This was like a very impactful full session and thank you for today. Thank you for your thank time. You. Thank you for All having me. All righty. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I love hearing how our panelists, active business leaders, use storytelling to combat relevant issues such as social injustice and making diversity more than a trend, while at the same time, you know, reinventing experiences for our consumers rooted in authenticity. So much packed into one panel. So thank you so much to hear in Latanya.